Hello. My sincere thanks to the organisers of this conference, to the panel and to you all for listening. This afternoon, I will discuss the potter's wheel in dynastic Egyptian and Sudanese sites, which to my colleagues not normally interested in the Nile Valley, I'll be focusing on the Middle Bronze Age. So several excavations around the Mediterranean basin have uncovered pottery workshops containing pottery wheel remnants. Investigations in Egypt and Sudan are different, however. Where pottery workshops are identified, potter wheel bearings are rare. This is despite many investigations of settlement sites, where due to the high frequency of wheel thrown pottery sherds, one might reasonably expect to find a pottery workshop with a wheel. So having analysed the academic literature, I know of only 32 possible dynastic period pottery workshops, as opposed to, say, bread ovens or metalworking furnaces, of which there are quite a few examples. This seems remarkably odd, given most archaeological sites in Egypt and Sudan regularly have tens of thousands of pottery sherds analysed at each site, but there are very few pottery workshops that have been uncovered. So why the discrepancy? Most settlements would have required the services of at least one, most likely set several pottery workshops to provide the local populace with the containers that they needed to store, produce, cook their food, brew their beer and so on. Is the reason for this lack of pottery production sites due to archaeological bias exploring, say, only the elite areas of settlements and the historical focus, perhaps, on tombs and temples to blame? Perhaps pottery workshops were located in areas that were built upon by later generations and so lost to archaeology. Perhaps they're difficult to identify from other craft workshops, or perhaps archaeologists are simply not looking in the right places. It is usually the existence of a kiln that's labelled as the defining characteristic of a pottery workshop. However, what if that isn't the case? Could these kilns be instead be used for a different purpose? So at this point, it's perhaps a good idea to indicate what I mean by a pottery workshop. Now, I know with this audience, I'm talking to the, the converted, you know what it is. But anyway, the most obvious is the kiln. But as I mentioned before, the identification of a kiln can be misleading. Sometimes the much smaller bread ovens are mislabeled as kilns. Rarer finds are potter's wheel bearings and wheel heads, drying hollow emplacement areas uh, where pottery would have been stored before it was fired, clay paddling pits and storage bins, which were often likely to be roofed, and potter's tools for making marks into the clay as they were or shaving away bits of clay as they were working on it. So the organisation of pottery workshops has been variously discussed by a variety of scholars, for example, Coston, Peacock, Rice, Vanderloo. The different steps and complexity of the production process suggest different levels of ceramic production. Consumption of products such as ceramics is assumed to be at local level, at least at the beginning, due to limitations of transport, market demands and ease of production. In most ancient societies, the basic level of organisation of production was focused on the household for reasons of self-sufficiency. In 1976, Vanderloo defined pottery household production as occasional, simple, and produced locally by non-specialists. While later in the 1980s, Rice added that the household system has little opportunity for specialization and intensification. When considering household production, the most technologically simple methods were employed with little investment in specialist machines or tools. However, when the potter's wheel is introduced, with the skill and length of time it would take to learn to use it, perhaps as much as 10 years to become a true proficient, the specialist potter emerges, and perhaps with it control from the state through elite sponsorship of the craft. Is there some indication of elite control through the location and design of workshops? The design of ancient potteries were likely not too dissimilar to modern ones. The typical potter's workshop in ancient times would have required access to water, fuel and clay sources and would have needed a working space to fashion pottery vessels, probably with structures to provide a shade from the hot sun for the workers and to allow for more controlled drying time of the pots. Residual finds such as unfired sherds, ash-filled pits, vitrified and silicious mud bricks and clay trampled floors are key indicators of pottery workshop areas. The size of the pottery workshop must have varied quite considerably. 
Unfortunately, it's not always certain of the extent of the workshop area. Uh, as in some excavation reports, archaeologists merely listed the existence of a kiln to indicate a pottery workshop. And it seems that the full extent of the workshop was either ignored in the final report or was not fully uncovered. It's quite likely that much of the drying and wedging of the clay took place in an outside or courtyard location, an area that would be difficult to detect archaeologically, whereas kilns are easier to detect as they are heated to a very high temperature of over 700 degrees Celsius and uh, would have been formed of mud bricks. Several types of kilns were utilised by people in the Nile Valley. This varied from the relatively simple pit, box and pot kilns where firing temperatures were hard to regulate uh, through to the more sophisticated updraft kiln. Pot kilns were probably an early attempt at temperature regulation where a large previously fired vessel was used rather like a sagar to protect the would-be fired pottery away from the excessive heat. Box kilns comprised of a u-shaped structure open at one side where the fire was positioned. Um, pottery was stacked within the structure, a fire set at the opening and the temperature loosely regulated by repositioning the fire. These more simple kilns continue to be used throughout dynastic times, though occur mostly in domestic settings. Uh, the updraft kiln came to be in use from Egypt about the same time as the potter's wheel and uh, the workshop, the more formalised state sponsored workshop. Uh, during Egypt's Old Kingdom in 2600 BC. They came to be used in Sudan much later, about 600 years later, when uh, the Egyptians started to colonise ancient Sudan. Updraft kilns are tall, biconical, circular or horseshoe shaped, ranging from a, just under um, half a metre to three metres in diameter. Their larger size and more controlled firing capabilities may have allowed the Egyptians to experiment with their pottery wares and to use um, moral clays, which were mined from the desert, that generally seem to be fired at higher temperatures than the more normally used Nile silts. In addition, the new style of kilns may have allowed the Egyptians to use finer pastes of clay for their pottery vessels, while increasing the likelihood of having more finished vessels surviving the firing process. These large kilns ensured greater fuel efficiency with less heat loss through the walls, higher temperature possibility and better control of the atmosphere around the pots. The best preserved kilns have perforated floors to allow air to flow through and around and circulate around the kiln. However, where supposed kilns are described, they're often rather small, just 50 to 60 centimetres in diameter, um, and often don't have this perforated floor or firebox like structure. And these are more likely to, a multi, to be a multi-purpose oven rather than just a pottery kiln. What about other items? So the dynastic potter's wheel bearings are very similar to those known across the Levant and Middle East. They comprised a socket and pivot of stone, usually granodiorite, limestone or basalt or a combination of the two as seen in this uh, British Museum example. The socket would have been buried into the ground and a wheel head of unfired clay, wood or terracotta attached to the top of the pivot. The potter would have spun it with one hand and thrown the pottery on the other. The concept of the potter's wheel was borrowed from their Levantine neighbours around 2600 BC and was gradually introduced to potters through um, a form of state sponsorship. The early wheel thrown pottery was produced exclusively for elite funerary sites, very, very small uh, model vessels um, given to the cult of the dead person. But the repertoires were gradually expanded until almost all pottery vessels were thrown on the wheel by about 2100 BC. We are quite fortunate in Egypt for the pictorial uh, material culture of potters and potting scenes. Old and Middle Kingdom models and tomb scenes dating between 2600 and 2000 BC indicate that there may have been particular areas where workshops were located, often close to craft workers um, in industrial quarters such as carpenters or blacksmiths. Um, as seen in uh, some of the Amarna and Gurob excavations or near to temples and palaces such as at Hierakonpolis. 
Whether all potters' workshops were near to palaces and as part of the estate of wealthy landowners is uncertain, but some archaeological remains indicate that some craft activities, notably potting, cobbling, painting, blacksmithing, and bread making, could all have been not blacksmithing, sorry, bread making, could have been performed at some level in the home. For example, at Amarna, one of the Amarna houses, P49.3-6, contained a vast amount of quantity of basalt chippings. Other houses contained amethyst and glass bead working areas, which would provide evidence of a series of workshops next to or within the courtyards of the houses. What about the archaeological evidence for pottery workshops? Are these consistent with the tomb scenes and models that we saw in the previous slide? What does a pottery workshop look like in the Nile Valley? Where and in what context do they occur? And does the location indicate state sponsorship or control? So order to, in order to address the above question, one needs to apply a criteria to determine what a pottery workshop should incorporate. Last year, I began a rather basic study of the known pottery workshops in Egypt and Sudan, which was recently published as part of a conference proceedings in Berlin, and a criteria was established. This analysed the 32 known dynastic potteries from the Nile Valley area. There are, with the caveat that there are many more examples which date to, the, to later Ptolemaic and Roman times, which I've ignored for uh, the purposes of this. So I came up with um, about four uh, types. So type one is within an estate or temple workshop area, just over 43%, close to 44% of the sample. Type two occurs on the outskirts of a settlement, often close to a water source and tends to be large with three plus kilns. And that was about 25% of the sample. Type three located close to a cemetery and specialised in the production of funerary vessels at around 9% of the sample. And then type four was pottery, a pottery works up within a town, which tended to be quite small scale production with one to two kilns at um, just under 16% of the sample. And then there was unknowns at 6% of the sample. So I thought it would be fruitful uh, for the purposes of this paper to take the criteria one step further and apply it to one large settlement where excavation has been relatively widespread and systematic. This should further the understanding of what archaeologists are missing in their perhaps piecemeal excavation of settlements. The location of some of the larger potteries at Amarna suggests elite control of the workshops. So, um, Amarna is an ancient city situated about halfway between Cairo and Luxor in the El Minya province, just as I'm indicating here. It's primarily known as the location of the ancient city of Akhetaten, famous for um, Pharaoh Akhenaten and his, and his beautiful wife Nefertiti. Um, it served briefly as the capital of Egypt from around 1347 to 1332 BC. This site has the distinction in Egypt of containing four pottery workshops and many more possible kilns or oven structures previously described by the Amarna project in the reports. Today, we'll re-examine these workshops as a case study. Ceramics during the Amarna period experienced, experienced a real blossoming of distinctive types, decorations and intricate moulds, very exciting for the uh, ceramicist. All vessels at this by this time were thrown on the wheel, with the exception of bread moulds and very large basins and some uh, cooking vessels. The city itself and its major outliers are arranged on a north-south strip not far um, along uh, from the river bank, connected by the broad and mainly straight Royal Road, um, which is a royal name. The central city, uh, which is just here, uh, contained um, the gigantic Great Palace, which was around 200 by 580 metres, uh, the King's House, another palace, uh, and two Aten temples and offices, storehouses, workplaces and barracks, all government buildings, and the so-called records office where the tablets known as the Amarna letters were found. It also had streets of small and medium-sized houses for clerks, mid-level government officials, and perhaps junior priests and temple servants. So for this purposes of this talk, we're going to be looking at the North Suburb, which is number one here. 
um, and two industrial quarters, two and four, as well as a private house of which um, number three is just one. As mentioned above, these areas are um, four definite potteries um, found at Amarna from their defining characteristics of containing a kiln or kilns, unfired pottery sherds and on two occasions pottery wheel bearings. However, there are many other firing structures identified as ovens across Amarna, but which might have been kilns as Nicholson in 1995 discovered when re-evaluating one area excavated by Ludwig Borhart, who was digging there between 1902 to 1908, uh, when amongst other things, he found the famous bust of Nefertiti. After the First World War, um, the concession was taken over by two archaeologists, one a Dutchman, Henry Frankfort, and another an Englishman, John Pendlebury, whose names will crop up shortly. So for our first um, item, we will go to the northern suburb of Amarna at one of the most sumptuously appointed houses known as T3611, which had its own private chapel surrounded by a large enclosure wall. T3611 is part of a series of similarly laid out large houses off the West Road North and was probably designed for an elite family and their household. Here, a complete basalt potter's wheel was located by Frankfurt and Pendlebury during the 1926 to 32 seasons. Its exact location within the house is uncertain as um, Frankfurt and Pendlebury were clearing the area on a semi-industrial scale and did not keep accurate records. It possibly came from the northeastern corner of the site where there are smaller buildings away from the main house, which may have contained uh, craft workshops. The potter's wheel bearings are made of granite diorite and the upper pivot stone is partially broken, perhaps why it was discarded. Intriguingly, the excavators do not mention that they uncovered kilns in the enclosure, although the circular feature at the south may be one. So we move next to the east of the main city to square Q484, a large rectangular industrial area. This was established during the reign of Tutankhamun, the now famous son of Akhenaten, when he was re-establishing the cult of Amun-Ra and was utilising the workman's village to the east for this purpose. Q48.4 was the manufacturing site for the pottery which supplied the workman's village approximately two kilometres away. Within the excavated squares, the pottery making area was located within the western edge of the enclosure. So just kind of here. With four small rooms and a courtyard. Within a small cubicle, a pivot made of basalt was discovered lying in a brick lined pit in a workshop area containing clay puddling pit, clay pot sherds and other potting paraphernalia. The brick lined pit was probably used for storing clay. A large water pot or zeer was buried in the ground with the neck open adjacent to the brick lined pit, presumably to supply the potter with water when rehydrating clay or forming vessels. A kiln was located uh, within the courtyard space, helpfully downwind from the workshop. Third pottery workshop was uncovered within the private house of the Army General Ramose. This area had previously been excavated by Lukewood Borhart's team, who had uncovered what he believed to be three bread ovens. You can see them here from his excavation reports. In the 1980s, this area was re-examined by Paul Nicholson, now of Cardiff University, who found that these were more likely to be three pottery kilns, as each had a separate hearth and firing chamber with a shallow floor. Nicholson noted that there was a surprising lack of pottery wasters, but lots of poorly fired sherds. Perhaps under firing rather over firing rather than over firing was a common problem here as fuel was scarce. Um, he postulated that these kilns were for domestic consumption, supplying the household, so they were perhaps irregularly used. And our final example, we move to the westernmost edge of the city, the area known as 045.1. It contained a variety of kilns that were established primarily for the production of faience and glass for temple and palace use. It's likely that the primary purpose of the faience production was for the making of inlays for use in the construction of the temples and palaces. And when these were completed, the installation along with that for glass production was abandoned or moved elsewhere. Just south of the glass furnaces, there was an area of pottery production, nearly 14 metres squared in area which contained its own kiln, a clay trampling floor made of fired mud bricks, which are quite unusual for um, Egyptian sites, bordered by a wall, which might indicate a roof to keep clay dry. 
There was also a clay paddling pit containing unfired sherds and clay turnings. So what does this mean when we return to the workshop criteria? Two of the industrial areas do fit in quite well with the type two criteria. On the outskirts of a settlement tends to be large scale production. They are both large scale production areas producing pottery and other materials for a purpose, either to supply the nearby temple in the case of 045.1 during their construction or producing pottery for the workman's village in the case of Q48.4. These areas do appear to be planned industrial quarters for a specific purpose rather than for domestic consumption. They are almost certainly well managed and state controlled, particularly in the area in the case of 045, which is producing highly elite glass objects. However, the other two pottery workshops occur within large private homes or estates and were producing pottery on a smaller scale, perhaps ad hoc supplying the house as and when the pottery was needing replacing. These workshops could be termed type one or type four, pottery of an estate, pottery within the town, tends to be small scale production with one to two kilns. However, it's particularly interesting that house T3611, a private house, did contain a potter's wheel bearing. This perhaps suggests that access to pottery wheels was no longer state controlled as it had been during the Old Kingdom when the potter's wheel was utilized solely for, for funerary cult pottery. As we've already noted, the Egyptian pottery repertoire by 2000 BC had become almost completely wheel thrown. So there is much more that could be said about the organisation of pottery workshops in Egypt, and I've really not had time to expand upon it in this paper. This is really the beginning of my understanding of the particular manner of Egyptian workshop production and the use of the potter's wheel. Sites such as the city of Amarna, which have been systematically excavated, begin to suggest the differences between state-sponsored large-scale production sitting alongside smaller private-scale production. However, in these four cases, it must be noted that the pottery workshop is located within some form of enclosure. Was the potter and the pottery they made always controlled to some extent, whether by the state or a wealthy estate land owner? Don't know. More work is needed. Thank you for listening. <laughs>